Welcome back, Picture Perfect people. We are in the home stretch with all of this aeration and seeding stuff. I'm sure that these videos that are focused so heavily on aeration seeding the last month or so are getting a little old, but this is one of the most important ones. In fact, it might be the most important one because while it's great to understand the actual process of aeration seeding and all the fine points of what can really make it a great successful service for your fescue lawn, none of that matters if all of that baby grass dies within a few weeks. So I'm going to teach you exactly what you need to know to maximize on your aeration seeding this fall and get an amazing return for next spring. Aeration seeding is a big deal as a service, both short term and long term. There's a lot that's happening at the exact moment that it's going on, that's why it's expensive, it's why it takes time, and why quality matters so much, but there's also a lot riding on that after process in terms of the care that's being given to it. It's very similar to when you have a surgical procedure done and the doctor sends you home with discharge instructions. The whole point of that appendectomy was to make you feel better, but you're going to ruin it if you go for a run and pop all of those stitches within 24 hours. And that's why we also give you aftercare instructions for your baby grass after that seed is put down, because we don't want you to disturb it and damage it and possibly kill it just a week or so after we leave from doing the aeration seeding service and all of a sudden have complications and consequences of a limited return. There are three big things to pay attention to during the fall and kind of time out and monitor to really maximize on that aftercare success. First is water. The frequency and duration at which you need to be watering your baby grass is very different from that which you use for adult fescue during the summer. So we really want to dial in on this to make sure that it's being watered properly. Second is any kind of wear and tear traffic, especially in regard to mowing. You want to stay off the grass as completely and for as long as possible as you can to really give it time to develop the way it needs to. And third are leaves. This can vary from property to property depending on how early or late in the aeration seeding window your seed is put down. But at the end of the day, the thicker those leaves get, the more of a risk they are to your baby grass, but the way in which you remove those leaves can be a risk as well. So we're gonna talk about all three of these things. First though, you should be expecting this, just give me a quick pause and go down to subscribe if for some reason you haven't done so already. This isn't the only amazing video that we're going to be putting out in the next few months. We've got a lot of great fall and even winter content coming up to answer a lot of your questions about the fine tuning of your fescue lawn. And while you're down there, why don't you go ahead and comment for me as well. I always appreciate that and I always try to respond to you guys, whether it's a really sophisticated question that I have to research first, or it's just saying, hey, I always want to hear from you. Let me know what your aftercare priorities are. Is that foot traffic and mower traffic something that's been an issue for you in the past? Or does watering seem to make all the difference? Are leaves a burden? Let me know. I really want to hear from you guys. So getting back on track, let's bring things back to center and talk about watering. As we've explored in great length in our how to water video from earlier in the summer, fescue really needs about an inch and a half of water per week when it's hot outside to keep from going completely dormant. For the most part, out of a combination of math simplicity and the actual efficacy of watering, a lot of people prefer to do kind of an every other day schedule, aiming for half an inch each time that they water. Depending on your water pressure, this can mean watering for maybe 20 minutes per zone or even 40 minutes per zone. That time varies, that's why you have to measure your actual water output. But big picture, we're looking at roughly 30 minutes per zone every other day in the morning. The reason for this schedule is not only to achieve the full amount of water that fescue really needs during the summer, but it's also to encourage deep root development. That's so important for a nutrient reason, as well as a water reason, as well as a sustaining through the summer reason. You want deep, complex roots and deep watering, that good, long soak in, is what really encourages those roots to stretch. 
So it makes sense. During the summer, we want deep watering in order to encourage deep root development so that those roots are going down to where it's cooler and there's more retained moisture long term. But during the fall, when our main priority is getting the seed to germinate and you're not dealing so much with a heat issue for your adult turf, you want more shallow watering. You want to keep that surface layer and that surface level where that seed is resting and settling and rooting damp and hydrated for as long and continuous of a duration as possible on a day-to-day -day basis. This is a very different schedule. That's a huge thing that you have to keep in mind. Instead of roughly 30 minutes every other day, you know, that long duration, long interval, we want to really draw that in and go for maybe five or 10 minutes at the most, several times a day, every day. So really short duration and really short intervals. Just like we know is the case with watering during the summer for that deep level where there's a fine balance between not watering enough and it still ends up being rock hard and dry versus watering too much and you've got a mud pit on your hands, it's a very fine balance as well with this short duration, short interval watering that is better for seed. You really need to figure out a balance, and this is a good thing to do ahead of time, but you want to find the balance between getting enough water that your seed stays damp for as long as possible and is encouraged to root without putting down so much water that it risks the seed floating and settling in different spots at all or can create any kind of rotting situation. Better learn balance. Balance is key. Balance good. Karate good, everything good. Balance bad, better pack up your home. Understand? You don't want your yard soil to feel dry, hard, or dusty, but you don't want it to feel squishy or see water standing or anything like that. Now, I know you don't want homework. I get it. We graduated already. We're done with it. But this is one of those situations where I have to give you a little bit of homework because every property is different. So try between the time that you watch this video and as soon as your seed goes down, hopefully you have time to do it beforehand, but if not, then just go out and try and do it today figure out what it takes to get that proper level of moisture. Most of the time it's a good rule of thumb to start with about five minutes and run your sprinklers to see if five minutes is all it takes to get that dampness without getting a bunch of pooling or anything like that. On the other hand, if you have a large property where there's a lot of time that it takes for those big sprinklers to come around, you might need to go for 10 minutes. You know your system, fine tune it, do what you need to do. The schedule that I recommend starting out with and fine tuning, so don't just go out and do this, make sure it's gonna work for your property, is five minutes per zone, three intervals per day, early morning, like when you would normally run it around 6 a.m., around noon and around late afternoon, but early enough that you still get at least two or three hours of daylight so that the grass can dry off a little bit and we're not getting late season fungus. Obviously, the important thing to do as well is to adjust for any kind of rainfall. Keep an eye on your forecast, get a weather app that's gonna tell you about how much precipitation you get each day, so that if we get a drizzle all day, obviously you don't need to water, weather is doing it for you, but if we get a downpour, you're still gonna need to water the following day because a lot of that ran off. Just use common sense to the best of your ability. Most of the time it's not gonna be perfect, but the whole point is that we are trying. I really, really cannot stress enough how important watering your grass seed is. More than any other time of the year, even summer, watering your seed in during the fall when it's growing and germinating is the most important thing you can do for it. It is directly linked to how successfully your seed germinates and how uniformly it develops. And this impacts the amount of winter weeds you get, the amount of thin and bare areas you have next spring, and as a result, the entire condition of your lawn next summer. Like I mentioned before, it's really beneficial if you can have this ironed out and ready to go by the day of your seeding service so that right out of the gate, as soon as the crew leaves, you're able to start on that five minute roughly interval of watering multiple times a day. And no, this isn't gonna last forever. Ideally, it should only last for a few weeks. It might take longer if we have a hot start to the fall and it takes a while for your seed to get going, but the really big thing to remember is that you don't want to change this watering schedule and Lord knows you don't wanna turn it off until that baby grass has reached a height of at least a few inches. Once that baby grass is two or three inches tall at least, then you can go back to your normal watering schedule and water it for depth at that point because we've gotten enough roots to give it a good foothold. 
you still don't want to turn it off. You don't want to winterize your irrigation system too early. Please don't winterize your irrigation system too early. I hate hearing, oh, well, we shut it off in September because the irrigation company offered us a discount. No, don't do that. You're losing out on so much water opportunity. So long as your grass is growing, which most years it does into November, it needs to be watered. All right, I think I'm done talking about water. Let's talk about actually being on the lawn. Like with watering, we made a video all about mowing at the beginning of the summer, so be sure to check that out as well in case you're able to benefit from it. But mowing with your baby grass is a very sensitive topic because your baby grass is so sensitive. Grass has feelings too, and mowing your lawn is very stressful to it. So imagine putting your baby, your baby grass, through adult levels of stress. You wouldn't give an 18 year old tax returns that are about to be audited, so why would you do that to your baby grass? Is that how auditing works? Never had to go through that, but comment below if you wanna get that personal and just let me know if that's actually how it works. But my point here is that there are all of these rules to really successfully mowing your grass to reduce that stress as much as possible in terms of how much of the grass you take off at once, how sharp your mower blades are, how frequently you cut it. And those rules only get stricter when that grass is really developing and in its infancy. Think of it this way. Your lawn has basically become a nursery. And as a nursery, you want to create a nice, peaceful, quiet, nurturing environment where that baby grass can develop to its greatest potential as quickly as possible. You're not going to send a carnival through a nursery. You're, you're going to wait until the grass is older than that so it can actually enjoy it and eat some popcorn. Babies don't like carnivals. It's a lot of noise and light and that's not what they need at that stage. So mowing is not what your baby grass needs until it's ready. Instead, focus on tranquil, focus on peaceful goose fraba. Very good. And just be patient. This is why we recommend mowing your grass a lot lower leading up to aeration seeding so that you have more wiggle room and can wait longer before cutting it once that seed is put down. And within all realms of possibility, especially in the first week or two, you really wanna reduce any kind of foot and paw traffic as much as possible. You heard me say within the realm of possibility. I, I get it, especially in the backyard. If you have pets or you have kids, that's gonna be near impossible. But don't bring out the slip and slide. Quit cutting through the lawn to the mailbox. Just give it a break. Try to stay off it to the best of your ability for as long as possible. A kind of good way to think about this is to break it down into the first few days, the first few weeks, and the first few months in terms of your average fescue germination and development. In ideal perfect incubator conditions, it takes about a week for fescue seed to even begin germinating. So during those first few days, disturbance is the biggest threat. If you run over with a mower and it sucks the grass seed up with the blades spinning, or you water too heavily and it creates drift and runoff, anything like that that can disturb the seed is going to be a detriment because all of a sudden you're losing that uniformity and shifting into really dense areas and really thin areas side by side. To the greatest extent possible, for at least the first few days, newly seeded areas should be kept off of completely by kids, pets, you yourself, and especially mowers. Within the window of the first few weeks, by now the seed has most likely germinated. That means we've got a really fine little blade of grass that's almost like hair, and we've got an even finer and even shallower root that just is barely hooking it into that soil layer. So we've got germination, it's not wanting to go anywhere on its own the way that seed will drift if you just breathe on it, but it is super fragile. At this point, if at all possible, it is still beneficial to keep foot and paw traffic off it as much as you can, but if necessary, it can stand to be crossed very gently. Very gently, very gently, no touch football. Don't, don't do it, I don't wanna hear about it. Just keep an eye on it from a distance as much as possible. But once that baby grass within those few weeks reaches a height of about three or four inches, and again, that's the baby grass, not the adult grass, it's at that point safe to mow gently. 
so those first few months, you know, once we've gotten past the few day panic and the few week sensitivity, those first few months you still have to be gentle with it. You can do the things, you can do the mowing and eventually you'll be able to turn the water off, but you still wanna get off it as quickly as you can when doing anything like that. I know, if you've made it this far in the video and you're hearing me say that, I'm sure you're gonna hit me up in the comments and say that's ridiculous. Months, I have to be careful on it for months. It seems like overkill, but this really is the most conservative and cautious way to really ensure a good quality service. And I'm really not exaggerating. Even walking across baby grass until it's to the point where you can mow it can not only break and damage that fine, fine grass blade, but it can uproot it because those roots are so fragile and fine. So it's something that I want you guys to be aware of and know the ideal way of handling it so that based on your lifestyle and what's realistic, at least you're growing into it knowing what should be done and how it might impact your service. I've got a large dog. He likes to go outside and run around. He runs around on the baby grass. It's not the end of the world, but it would probably be better if he didn't. It's just something to keep in mind. So where that first mow that you do of your baby grass is concerned, there are two vital things that I really need you guys to keep in mind. First, there's no excuse for going out there with unsharpened mower blades. You have like three or four weeks at least between the time that your seed goes down and that first cut that you're going to be doing to get your blades sharpened. And you can do it sooner than that or you can do it yourself. Just make sure that your grass blades are sharpened. It can tear and seriously damage that baby grass if those blades are dull. Second, be gentle go figure, right? But you want that mow to be on the highest setting possible. Even if you're just passing over that baby grass and only cutting the adult grass that's grown up that much, you want it on that high setting because it's been a long time since the adult turf has been cut and you don't want to stress it out either if you can avoid it. Think of the whole lawn as one big ecosystem at this point. On top of that, you should only try to go over it once. This is another situation where bagging is acceptable if the alternative is leaving clumps. Don't mow it over three, four times. Don't stripe it, don't worry about that. That's not what's important right now. Bag your clippings if you need to so that they don't leave any clumps and only go over it once and then hop right off to keep from stressing out that baby grass and crushing it. Ideally, you should wait to do this initial cut until the baby grass has grown in at least three inches tall. And that generally coincides with the point at which it's safe to change your watering schedule from the baby grass watering to the adult grass watering. And remember, this will take at least a few weeks in a lot of situations more. I'm gonna keep this section of the video a little bit shorter because I'm sure you guys are getting burnt out on hearing me talk about it and fuss at you like this so long. But leaves are a threat to baby grass. They smother it out just like they do adult turf and there are ways to remove it that are gonna be safer than others, especially when we keep in mind that few day, few week, few month time span. This is where backyards and properties that are overall wooded are at a significant disadvantage compared to the more wide open lawns. Wide open lawns really struggle in the summer. You're getting direct sun all day. It will cook. You have to water a lot more. Summer is a pain. My wooded properties and my backyards with a tree line, that's going to suck in the fall. It just does. It's one of the things that we have to deal with. There is a way to handle it with your seed in mind and there is a way to destroy your seed. Two ways of destroying your seed where leaves are concerned in the fall. First, you let it go and leaves build up and all of a sudden that baby grass that's trying to develop and photosynthesize gets completely smothered out and rots. This will happen to your adult turf too, so don't be lazy. That was an ableist thing to say, but I, I hope you understand my point. If you are physically able to get your leaves cleared off the lawn, please do so. And if it is at all within your budget as an alternative to have somebody do it for you, please do so. If you're investing in aeration seeding and developing a healthy lawn in the first place, it really, really makes me sad to see all of that progress and investment lost because of leaves. Way number two in which fall leaves can completely destroy your shot at a good seeding result, and that is the way in which those leaves are removed. Rakes will tear up baby grass. Those fragile roots that we just talked about will absolutely be torn up and destroyed if you're putting a rake over it over and over again. That's 
crazy aggressive and horrible for your adult turf, let alone your baby turf. So don't rake, just don't ever rake, don't buy a rake unless you really hate your lawn. And the second way is mowing those leaves up. I know I have a lot of clients that mow their leaves, but keep in mind how we just talked about with that mowing, you don't wanna go over the grass more than once. When you're mowing up your leaves, you almost always have to go over and over again, going in circles, that's gonna tear up your grass. So just don't, don't do that either. The best way to get the leaves off your lawn and have the lowest amount of risk of disturbing that baby grass and that seed is to use a blower. Blow gently across the lawn, not straight down. Don't blow straight down, just go gently across the lawn and push those leaves to wherever you wanna go. All right, I'm pretty much done with the lecture about how to take care of your seed. I don't want you to think that I'm nagging or anything like that. I just want you guys to understand how important a good aftercare regimen is to really good development of your investment with aeration and seeding. And like with any investment, it's totally normal to be eager to see those results as quickly as possible. I get it. But like fertilizer and pretty much every aspect of turf management where we're dealing with biology and geology working together, it takes time. It takes at least a week for that seed to even germinate at all. And then it takes at least several weeks for it to develop to a height even close to the adult turf. Then after that, it takes a few months for it to thicken up and harden up where it looks uniform with the lawn and you feel like you have that beautiful picture perfect lawn you were so excited to see. That's why patience is truly a virtue where seeding is concerned. And if you've made it through the video to hear me even talk about this, then clearly you're a patient person and you're gonna be fine. But for your neighbors, if they say, oh, well, why isn't my seed coming up yet? It just takes time. You want your grass to develop healthily rather than quickly. But I promise you, if you follow a proper aftercare protocol with correct watering, staying off of it as long as possible, correct mowing practices, and good leaf removal and good patience, you're going to have good success. I appreciate you guys watching as always. Again, be sure to subscribe and comment below to let me know if there's anything that you have questions about with your seeding service or anything else related to your lawn. Have a great day, keep it picture perfect, and we'll see you guys later. Beep, 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 beep. <laughs>